So in this video, this is going to be an intro to linear transformations, and I think it's helpful to talk about how we got here. So first of all, we've been talking about matrices just as this rectangular array of numbers that we do things with. And another term that I would just like to review here is the idea of an n-tuple. So this really represents the solution to a linear system with n unknowns. So I have s1, s2, all the way up to sn. So these are all the, the different parts of the solution with n unknowns. Um, so when you have a system with two equations, you just have like an ordered pair. But if you have more, then we just call it an n-tuple. OK, so the set of all ordered n-tuples is actually denoted like this. And we call this Rn. Um, and so this is a fancier looking R and it also represents the, the real numbers. Um, but this is now specifically representing real numbers within an N tuple. And I just want to make sure it's like clear. So usually when we write this by hand, it's this R with this double line through it. Now different books can do different things. I've seen books use like different cursive scripts for this R. Um, but usually when I write it, I write it with this double line just to make it clear what I'm referring to. It's not a normal R. It, it represents real numbers. And then, yeah, we call this Rn. Okay, so we call the elements of Rn vectors. And there's a couple ways that we can denote them. So you'll notice in books, they usually use boldface type. Um, this would be really inconvenient to do by hand. So if you are writing by hand, a lot of times you just use arrows like this. And um, so we also have that vectors can be represented specifically as column vectors. So I can have an n-tuple, which looks like this. Or I could rewrite the n-tuple as a column vector as shown here. OK, so n-tuples versus vectors. So a lot of times we say that n-tuples are called the comma delimited form while a vector is called the column vector form. They are the same thing. They're just two different forms of the same thing, basically. But where we're going, we're interested in talking more about what we think of things as vectors, although we will kind of switch back and forth between the two, just depending on what we're doing. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is this concept of standard basis vectors. So in Rn, you will have 1, 2 through n of these. And so this is a specific form of vector. So for instance, E1 means that in the first position you have a 1. Everything else through the next n slots, or to n minus 1 slots, I guess, are zeros. Then for E2, that would mean that the second entry is a 1, but everything else is a 0. So if I have EI, then this would be all zeros, except in the ith position you have a 1. So these are called the standard basis vectors. And so like in R3, we would have, so here's my E1, so I have 1, 0, 0. My E2 would be 0, 1, 0. And my E3 would be 0, 0, 1. OK, so um, we call these the standard basis because any vector can be represented as a linear combination of them. So just to show you like a little basic example of this. So if I had this vector now, 7, 2, 5, so I could rewrite this using my standard basis vectors. So this would be 7 times E1, 2 times E2, and 5 times E3. So that's why we call them the standard basis vectors. Now, um, just to save my hand a little bit, I, I typed a few things out. So just something that like we should know from algebra. So we've talked a whole bunch about functions in the past. Functions a rule that associates each element in a set A to only one element in another set B. And so generally, we make these uh, associations with the notation f of A equals B. So this is something that you probably know by this point. And so we say that B is the image of A under F, or F of A is the value of A. And so the set A is called the domain, and the set B is called the codomain. And then the subset of the codomain that consists of all images of the elements of the domain is what we know call as the range. So codomain and range are very, very similar. Um, I, some people may have never heard of the idea of a codomain. So codomain is just like everything that could have been mapped to, but then like the range is what you actually map to, OK? So where we are going is we want to turn our attention specifically to functions 
in this domain RN and the codomain RM. And so in this setting, to denote the function, we use the letter T, and T is a type of function called a transformation. So now we're going to talk about this idea of these transformations from RN to RM. So we're going to let T be a function with the domain in RN and the codomain in RM. So we specifically then call T a linear transformation from RN to RM, or equivalently, we say T maps from RN to RM. And then we denote this with this notation. So this is how you know that we're specifically referring to a, a transformation and you know exactly what the domain and the codomain are by this notation. Now, in the event that n equals m, so it just goes from rn to rn, then we say that t is a linear operator. So we have a linear transformation. A linear operator is just a specific case of a linear transformation. So basically, we're just shifting how we think about matrices with this terminology. So we go from having this idea of a rectangular array to now we're thinking about these as specific functions, OK? So, OK, let's think back to maybe how this all got started. So you had some random system. So I have this system here of, so I've got m different equations with n variables. And so I had all my coefficients. You can see I've got all my coefficients laid out here. So in matrix notation, what we would have done is we would have just rewritten everything as you see here. So here are my w1, w2, all the way down. And then I have everything else laid out in. So here's my coefficient matrix. And then I had this, this like x vector. And so the way that we could have written this would have been like this. We almost wrote it as like, it almost felt like its own like little linear equation, right? But in a matrix equivalent form of it, right? So this was the notation that we used before. So what I'm saying is now we're just going to make a slight tweak in how we think about this. So as a linear transformation, now we want to think of this as taking a vector x, which is an Rn, and then mapping it to the vector, this vector w in Rm by multiplying x on the left by a. So it's like the exact same thing. We're just changing the way that we describe it. So I have my mapping now. I know that this is a linear transformation. So this would be how I would define this linear transformation. And then I would define this as instead of being w times ax, I would look at just how this is like a slight tweak. This is now in a functional form, right? And remember, so normally when you think of functions, you think of like f of x. Well, what I'm saying is that for a linear transformation, we're thinking of this as t sub a of x. So it's just a slightly different way of expressing the same thing. Another way we could express this is we could have this x mapping on to this x vector mapping on to vector w by this ta. This is an equivalent way you could also represent this linear transformation. OK, so I just want to like think about this idea of this rn, rm with a couple of specific numbers. So let's say that I have my transformation, so t sub a of x. So this will be defined by a times the vector x. So what is the domain and codomain if a has the size 4 by 5? OK, so now the way that we're going to think about our matrices is that this last number is actually referring to a part of the domain. So this will be r5, while the, the first number is referring to the codomain, so it'll be rn. So my domain then is r5 and my codomain is r4. OK. So maybe you just want to pause and just replicate that just to make sure you've got it in your brain for this three by one matrix. You could pause here and then hit play. So in this case, so my domain would just be R. So when it's R1, we just say R. We don't, we don't put the one there. And then the codomain would be R3. OK, so once again, so just to show you like another way that we could kind of look at this. So let's say that I have some sort of linear transformation. This is another way that, and, and we'll build up to playing with this more. I just wanted to show you one of these. Let's say I have this linear transformation. So this t of x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. So now I'm using an n tuple. And so 
I define this as such. So this is another way we could define our transformation. So the question is, if this is my transformation, what's the domain and what's the codomain? Okay, well in this case, we've got a three tuple. This is also actually a three tuple. So that's telling us everything that we need to know. More specifically, this part's going to refer to the domain. This part's going to refer to the codomain. So my domain will be R3. My codomain is also R3. But so um, we just want to, again, like think about these as mappings from one vector space into another or operators. In this case, this would be a linear operator. Okay. So now I just want to show how we can represent a transformation from R4 to R3 defined by this system here. So just to have something specific with numbers here. Okay, so first what you might want to do is you might want to just take a second to pause the video here and just write out how would you represent this system with matrices just as a quick review for yourself and then you could hit play. So. If I wanted to represent this system with matrices, it would look like this. So I've really got everything that I need here for my linear transformation. I just need to like pivot the way that I'm thinking about this. So where previously I would have just written out an equation, this W equals AX where, you know, these are vectors. Now, instead of writing it out as an equation, I'm just going to write it as a linear transformation in this transformation notation, which is really function notation. So, now, instead of having this equals W here, I'm writing this out in this function notation that is the linear transformation. And so the idea behind this then is this takes us into everything with how a function really works, right? So the idea is then I could define some vector X, maybe something like one, zero, five, two. So if I asked you then to evaluate my transformation of X, well, you would know now that I'm ask, asking you to plug this value into my function. And so coming back here, then whatever I had for my vector value, I would just plug that in whatever numbers I wanted. And then I would do the multiplication. So it's just a slight tweak in really how we are thinking about things. And there are two, are two other transformations that I, I want to just state our standard that I want to throw out um, before I end this video. So the first is the zero transformation. So this would just be a, an M by N matrix of zeros. And so we would denote it as this T sub zero of X. And so this really just zero times X. So this will just end up being a zero vector. So this takes our, our vector X into, so from RM into RM as a zero vector. So just an M sized vector of zeros. We also have the identity operator. So this is going to be for we have I the identity matrix, the n by n identity matrix. So we can define this as this. So now we've got this T sub I of X. So this will just be I times X, which of course will just get us back to X. So that means that I maps every vector in RN to itself. And that's why this is just going from RN to RN. So it's called an operator again, right? Okay. And so those are kind of the basics. So we'll talk more about properties and other things that you can do with them as we go along. So if you found that video helpful, um, I would love it if you hit the like button. And otherwise, I will talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.